Welcome. Today I want to look at seven major atonement theories. Now, simply put, atonement theories are just the way that the church has historically tried to understand the meaning of Christ's life, death, and resurrection. And so, of course, we all agree that because of Christ, we are saved from sin and reconciled to God. But the question becomes, how does Christ's life, death, and resurrection actually accomplish this? And so that is where atonement theories come into play. And while there are many other theories that I may list in this video, I have chosen these seven because they are the most historically dominant views that the church has held. Now, there is an exception, of course, with number seven, but we'll get to that in a second. Now, before we begin, I do want to state that these theories are not necessarily mutually exclusive. Um, it is actually possible to hold many of these theories at once. And um, I'm of the opinion that we should pursue a more nuanced approach to the atonement besides just having one or two of these theories be the end-all be-all of how we understand the atonement. Um, typically, that's what happens in the church. We take one of these and the, we lift them up as the ultimate meaning of the life and death of Jesus Christ. Um, but in a sense, the cross must be understood as far more complex than any of these one theories can comprehend. And so I think it's important to keep mystery and awe at the forefront of our mind whenever we begin to discuss the atonement. Um, and especially because Christ's death is such a profound event um, that no one man-made theory will be able to comprehend it. Um, to borrow a phrase from T.F. Torrance, the atonement should be more adored than expressed. And so while we strive here to express some of these in simple terms so that you can understand them, ultimately the goal is to lead you closer to God in a more worshipful attitude and posture of adoration. But I hope that by exploring these theories, I will be able to expand your understanding of the atonement and hopefully introduce you to a few of the different ways that the church has understood Christ's death historically. So with that said, let's begin. So the first theory is called the moral influence theory. Uh, this basically states that God became a man in Jesus Christ to bring about a positive change in humanity, a change which is brought about through Christ's example. Now, this theory was one of the earliest theories that the church held. A notable proponent of this theory was St. Augustine, uh, who held it in connection with the ransom theory, which we'll discuss next. But generally speaking, this theory emphasizes the life of Christ, his words and deeds being perceived then as a moral example set for us to follow. So in this theory, the death of Christ is a catalytic event to initiate the reform of society. Now, it is important here to stress that this theory should never be confused with self-help moralism that's common in the secular world today. Um, instead, it is indeed in this theory the Holy Spirit who empowers us to live more Christ-like lives. So we can see that the moral life held up by this theory is not a kind of abstract morality, but a life lived in close communion with God, who alone is the source of all goodness. And so the point here is not that we can be moral apart from God, but rather the exact opposite, that true morality is only achieved that uh, goodness is only achieved in connection with God. So Jesus lives that example perfectly as one who, who lived in absolute unity with the Father. And so by that example, we see that what it actually is to be a good and a true human being is exemplified in Christ's life through his closeness with the Father. Now, there are two major benefits to this theory. The first one is that it refocuses the atonement on the life of Christ and not merely on his death. Most atonement theories that we'll discuss in this video um, focus so much more on the death of Christ, but I think they do so sometimes at the expense of neglecting the life of Christ as also being for our salvation. So the second benefit of this theory is that it joins together the morality or the ethics of Christ with the salvation of Christ. So to be a Christian is not just to say a prayer, but is actually to follow the way of Jesus Christ. So it stresses here that to be a Christian is not to just simply profess Christ, but truly to walk the way of Christ, following both the words and deeds of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And so some of the more transactional theories of the atonement miss this point and often create a wedge between the ethical aspect of the gospel and the salvific aspect of the gospel. The fact that we are saved does not necessarily mean that we no longer have to do good works, as James makes very clear in his epistle, um, but rather the actual event of salvation implies that we are set on the path towards the way of Jesus Christ. And so some modern theologians such as Jürgen Maltman have really stressed the way of Jesus Christ over just simply the profession of Jesus Christ, that we actually are called as believers to walk in this way and not merely to profess some 
doctrinal truths, uh, profess a bunch of creeds, and then assume that that's enough. And so the ethical aspect of this is very important. And so for that reason, it's quite a helpful atonement theory. And as we'll see further on, a lot of the um, theologians of the church held this theory alongside others. And so I think it's a very helpful one in that regard. So the second theory I want to talk about is called the ransom theory. This was likely the first and most robust systematic theory about the atonement that was held by many theologians in the early church. Simply put, this theory states that Jesus died as a ransom sacrifice. His death was thus payment made either to Satan directly, which was the most predominant view, or to death, or to God the Father. And so this mechanism of a payment unto either death, Satan, or the Father is the main crux of this theory. And so Christ's death is therefore the satisfaction of a debt which human sin inherited from Adam. So redemption means here to buy back, to purchase the human race from the clutches of the devil. And so obviously the main controversy here is going to be the idea that God must somehow pay the devil which in itself implies that the devil is somehow on the same standing with God or of the same status of being as God, which is, of course, problematic. And other theologians um, we'll talk about later uh, saw that and recognized the problem of this. But modern interpreters of this are a bit more charitable towards it and stress that it's not necessarily the devil that was paid, but rather death and evil itself that is paid off through the ransom theory. And so sometime this language about the devil, it feels antiquated to us, but actually this is just kind of the language, um, some of these modern interpreters say, um, this is kind of the language that the church just used to as a stand-in for evil and sin. And so a theory that's quite similar to the ransom theory is number three, which is Christus Victor. Now, this is generally considered to be the most predominant theory of the entire church leading up to the 12th century when St. Anselm came up with his satisfaction theory. So in this theory, Christ died to defeat the powers of evil, such as sin, death, and the devil, in order to free humanity from bondage. And so it differs from the ransom theory because there is no payment being made either to the devil or to God. The cross is then not a transaction, but a triumphant display of God's might and power to defeat sin. Gustav Allen famously argues in his classic book on the subject that this is the most consistently held theory for all of church history. He summarizes the theory like this, quote, The work of Christ is first and foremost a victory over the powers which hold mankind in bondage, sin, death, and the devil. In my limited reading in church history, I do have reasons to suspect that Allen is correct here um, in his assessment that this theory is the most consistently held. Um, and I think that even if somebody holds a different theory as the predominant theory, it's very likely that many hold this theory in conjunction with others, even if it's not the primary theory. And I think that speaks to somewhat of the simplicity of the theory, but I think we shouldn't underestimate it as being one of the essential aspects of what the gospel is proclaiming. Um, Christ's death truly is this defeat of sin, evil, and death, and that should be one of the central aspects of what we proclaim we proclaim the gospel and the fourth theory i want to talk about is called the satisfaction theory this was famously put forward in the 12th century by saint anselm um, and it was also the first major challenger to the christus victor theory and the theory simply states that christ's death satisfied the justice of god satisfaction here means restitution or a mending of what was broken and a paying back of a debt and so anselm emphasized the justice of god with his theory and claims that sin is primarily an injustice against God that must be corrected. And so in this theory, Christ died to pay back the injustices of human sin and to satisfy the justice of God. And so Anselm developed this theory primarily in reaction to the ransom theory, which we previously discussed, uh, because he rightly saw it was flawed by its implication that God might have to pay the devil or owe anything to the devil which of course makes the devil about as powerful as God, which is dualistic and highly problematic. Um, and so it was in reaction to that theory that he developed this satisfaction theory. Um, but in reversal to the ransom theory, it is not God who owes the devil, but humanity that owes a debt to God. And so our sin has actually stolen from God's justice, and Jesus pays back God with his death on the cross, thus satisfying God's justice. And so it is also significant to note here that this is one of the very first atonement theories that brings up the idea that God must be acted upon by the atonement. Or in other words, that God is the object of the atonement. And that is because Jesus is said to satisfy something in God's nature. In, in this case, it is God's justice. And so we'll come back to that idea later, but that's just worth noting out as we start. So the fifth theory is the penal substitutionary theory of atonement. 
Now, this was developed upon Anselm's theory, and it builds upon many of its important elements, but there are a few key changes that have been made with this theory that make it unique. So this theory simply states that Jesus dies to satisfy the wrath of God against human sin. So Jesus is thus punished in our place, and that's exactly where the name comes from. Pino meaning punishment, and substitutionary meaning in substitution of someone. And so Jesus is punished in our place. Um, and so Christ's death satisfies, therefore, the holiness of God, and it appeases God's wrath and his obligation to punish sin. And so because of Christ's death, we can be forgiven because the wrath of God was poured out fully on Jesus Christ. So the theory is often explained in a kind of courtroom drama. Um, so God is the judge, and you are the one on trial. You have sinned against the judge and you are deemed guilty, and you are rightly set to be punished. But then Christ steps in, and he takes your punishment upon himself. He goes away, the jailer takes him away, and you are set free. And so that is typically how the theory is explained. Um, another important aspect to consider is the uh, role of imputed righteousness um, in this theory. That's, that's a pivotal idea. Now, recent critics of this theory have pointed out how it's a, somewhat improper to make God the object of the atonement, because in this theory, unlike how Paul put it, uh, where God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, rather, it kind of makes it seem as if God is the one that needed to be reconciled with God's self, with the Son. Uh, the wrathful Father needs to be reconciled with the merciful Son. And so it somewhat splits the Trinity into having different motivations, um, whether or not this critique is valid, that's some of the modern critiques. Um, in addition to that, it's been criticized for being far too violent. And so, as we'll see in a minute, a lot of non-violent atonement theories have developed in reaction to this theory. But regardless, this theory is very important because it is undoubtedly the most common theory known today, both on a popular level and in a theological level, um, especially among the Reformed and the Evangelical. Now, the sixth theory I want to talk about just briefly is the governmental theory, which is basically just penal substitutionary atonement, but with a little bit of a twist to it. Um, and so instead of Christ suffering the full punishment of God in our place, he suffered merely a punishment. And so with this, God displays God's displeasure against sin, but it doesn't remove God's displeasure against sin. It doesn't remove his wrath or the need for punishment. So that threat of punishment still exists, but now there is a place where you can be safe from it, and that is the church. So the church, in the sense, kind of takes on the metaphor of Noah's Ark, where it's a shelter and a safe haven from the punishment of God. And so in order to be saved, you take part in the church, and therefore Christ died for the church only, and everyone else still has the wrath of God and the punishment of God hanging over them. Now, this theory is primarily held in the Methodist church, um, and I bring it up really just because I wanted to show how such a subtle change in verbiage really has drastic impacts to how we proclaim the gospel. And so atonement theories have such a pivotal role in how we understand the church, eschatology, salvation, all of these things. And so subtleties are very important to pay attention to. And, and so I bring this up mostly for that example. Um, but it is also a historically relevant one. And so that's also why we're talking about it. Finally, the seventh theory I want to talk about is the scapegoat theory. Now, this is a modern theory of the atonement, and so it doesn't necessarily fit on this list. I've, I've tried to keep this list um, focusing on the predominantly historical theories, the theories that the church has held over a long period of time. And so this theory doesn't really fit in that because it is a modern theory. Um, it's still relatively unknown, but I think it's interesting to consider it in a list such as this one because it kind of shows that history isn't this static thing, this dead thing, but it's actually something that still we're interacting with still today. And so these theories are never something that are fixed in stone, but uh, it's important to be able to have a conversation with those. And I think this theory shows best of all the way that theologians in recent times have had conversations with the past, have had conversations with these different theories, and tried to correct some of the errors of other of what are perceived to be errors in other theories. And so this one in particular is in response to penal substitutionary atonement and its violent elements. And so this is a nonviolent uh, atonement theory. Now, two key figures in this theory are the French theorist René Girard and the Catholic theologian James Allison. So one of the benefits of this theory is that it moves away from some of the problematic notions of other atonement theories, especially the violent implications of them, and what it means for the doctrine of God. And so one of the common critiques against penal substitutionary atonement is that it turns God into this ch cosmic child abuser. And so this moves away from the idea that God is 
um, is acted upon in the atonement, that Jesus dies to satisfy the wrath of God and to suffer God's punishment. And it stresses that God acts for our good and not for solving some sort of internal dispute within God's self. So with that said, what does this atonement theory claim? Um, and so simply put, instead of Jesus dying to satisfy God's violent urges, this theory reverses the story and states that Jesus died as a scapegoat to satisfy human violence, not divine wrath. And so humanity is the violent actor in this theory, and the cross satisfies our need for violence. So Gerard's theory is quite complex, and so we have, don't have time to get into all the intricacies of it, but basically the mechanism of how this theory works can be summarized in four points. And so first, Jesus is killed by the violent crowd. Second, the crowd thinks that he is guilty. Now third, Jesus is proven innocent and proclaimed to be the true son of God. And thus, the fourth action is that the crowd is then deemed guilty and its violence is condemned. And so uh, S. Mark Helm has a very clever way of summarizing this where he says, God used our sin to save us from that sin. And so it is important to recognize the immediate political implications of such a theory. So it is not merely that God saves individuals from their sin, though of course he also does that, but that God saves society from its social sins, namely from violence. So another important implication to this is that God is no longer the violent judge or the wrathful taskmaker. Instead, God here identifies with the victim and proves their innocence against the violent crowd. And so God is no longer identified with the one who does the violent act, but rather God is the one who suffers the violence. God is the victim of violence. And so that has a lot of social and political implications that are quite, quite profound. So I hope this overview of each theory has been helpful. I do plan to do more videos on the atonement in the near future. I may make this into a mini series of sorts. Um, and I do want to include in that a few critiques, for example, of penal substitutionary atonement, um, which I kind of hinted at a little bit here. Um, but I may also go into more depth on different theologians and how they approach these different theories. And so keep an eye out for that. Below I'll have listed several resources that could be helpful for you, books on each of these, um, as well as some of my favorite books about the atonement for further reading. And so I hope you check those out and kind of do some more reading on your own. Um, but for now, thank you so much for watching. If you have any questions or you have any comments about the way I interpreted some of these theories, just let me know in the comments below. Um, but thanks for watching, and I hope you have a great day.